and and uh, Richard, good to see you. Good morning. Okay, let's start. Um, okay, so so good morning, everyone. You know, welcome to the uh, APPN conference, Asia Pacific Public Policy Network conference. And the, the conference is, is, this year is, is hosted by the Department of Asian Policy Studies at the Education University Hong Kong. And my name is Alex Jingwei He. I'm the Associate Head of the Department and very happy to be the moderator of the opening ceremony and the plenary sessions this morning. And uh, due to COVID-19, and we are not able to hold it in a face-to-face -face mode, but hopefully this virtual mode of the APPN conference doesn't undermine the quality of scholarly uh, exchanges. And this conference is also generously supported by three very prominent journals in the field, uh, Policy and Society, uh, policy, practice, uh, policy Design Practice, as well as the Journal of Asian Public Policy. Three of the journals are all published by Routledge. And um, so the, the format of the opening ceremony today is, we'll first invite you know, uh, Professor Le Dailo and Professor Michael Holley to deliver opening speeches, and then we'll directly move to the plenary sessions. Uh, so first of all, could I invite Professor Le Dailo, Vice President of Research and Development uh, of the Education University of Hong Kong to you know, deliver his welcome address. Professor Le, please. Yes, thank you, Alex. Um, on behalf of the Education University of Hong Kong, uh, I would like to welcome you all um, to this virtual conference. Um, quite honestly, previously, I would say that, you know, welcome to our campus. Uh, and I would uh, probably give you a brief introduction of uh, uh, how nice the environment that we have here. Uh, but nowadays that we, we welcome you from different time zones to this virtual conference. but. Um, um, though we are not meeting face to face, but I'm sure that uh, the quality and the, um, the most important is the contents of um, our academic exchange would um, very much uh, as productive as um, it used to be. I understand that this is the sixth annual conference of the Asia Pacific Public Policy Network. Uh, it has been going on for a number of years um, and it's been a very successful conference uh, in previous year and I'm sure the same thing um, this round. Um, I have flipped through the uh, conference program and uh, topics of um, talks as well as uh, plenary sessions. Uh, I, I see uh, important keywords that address longer term changes like digitalization, big data, uh, information disclosure, transparency, uh, governance, and, and, and so on. But at the same time, I also see keywords that address issues right in front of us, uh, crisis, uh, governance, uh, resilience, response, of course, COVID-19, um, social protests, uh, and all these issues. So I find uh, the program itself, and also, of course, the work of all the participants most engaging. And this, I do believe that is a very important part of our life as an academic, as well as a researcher that is to respond to uh, current challenges as well as long-term challenges um, uh, for not only our own society, but for the international community as well. Um, I see uh, uh, important topics being raised uh, by colleagues, uh, particularly issues concerning, say, inclusive governance, um, um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, transparency, uh, disclosure of information in the context of um, uh, health crisis, um, measures to respond to uh, crisis, as well as um, how to ensure that we would continue to address issues like inclusiveness and equity. Um, I really appreciate the opportunity uh, given to us uh, by the Asia, Policy, Asia Pacific Public Policy Network. And I would also like to thank um, all my colleagues in uh, the Department of APS uh, for all the hard work of organizing. Uh, particularly probably to Alex, uh, he would be hosting uh, sessions as well as uh, coordinating uh, a lot of these activities. Um, I, I, I do hope that um, our, our exchange uh, would soon go back to the state that we, we, we used to have uh, without depreciating the values of um, meetings over internet. Uh, but sometimes we do need to interact among ourselves uh, both uh, during academic 
discussion as well as doing coffee breaks and, 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 and other moments. Uh, for us, uh, they are equally important, particularly for sharing of ideas. Um, so I take this opportunity to, to, to congratulate the organizers as well as saying, I do look forward to uh, the seventh or probably the eighth uh, annual conference of this network. Um, hopefully that we would be able to see you again uh, in the campus of uh, the Education University of Hong Kong. Once again, I congratulate um, you all for organizing this conference. And I hope that this would be a, the beginning of a very productive exchange among yourselves. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Lui, for your kind words and encouragement. Actually, we kicked off this conference yesterday with the two pre-conference workshops that were tailor-made for uh, PhD students and young scholars. And uh, both you know, events were attended by more than 100 participants. And we talked about you know, how to navigate the PhD journey, how to look for jobs during this turbulent period of time, and how to convert you know, research into publications. Uh, the two events, the two workshops yesterday was tremendously successful. And I believe that the students you know, and young scholars benefited a lot. And uh, next, I would like to invite Professor Michael Howlett, um, uh, Chair Professor of uh, Department of Political Science at Simon Fraser University. And Professor Howlett was also one of the um, kind, of, kind of founders of the APPN network. He, he has been very you know, helpful in you know, building up this uh, you know, regional network Work. So, Professor Hollett, please. Oh, thank you, Alex. Um, yes, uh, I just wanted to say uh, a few quick words on behalf of the uh, steering committee of the uh, APPPN, and uh, you know, to uh, to thank you for this opportunity to take part, at least virtually. Uh, of course, I wish I was there, but uh, maybe next year or some at some point in the future. Um, on behalf of the association, I just, I'd like to welcome everyone, the participants and presenters, and plenary speakers, and so on. Uh, to this, uh, this event, as, as Professor Louis had mentioned, this is the sixth uh, annual event that the uh, APPPN has, uh, has had, the last one being in Perth at the University of Western Australia last year. Um, this is a very strong lineup. Um, I'm sure everybody's seen that from the, uh, from the program. And um, I'm really looking forward to the, uh, to the presentations and, and discussion over the next couple of days. It was very gratifying to hear about the success of the pre-conference aspects um, yesterday. Um, like Professor Louis, I'd also uh, like to thank the, uh, the organizers on the ground there at, at uh, ADUHK in advance. Um, one of the interesting aspects of the virtual format, of course, is that people tend to go in and out a little bit more than they would uh, at, at these kinds of events when they're live, and so you're never sure at the beginning who actually will be there at the end. So I think that rather than saying uh, the traditional thanks at the end. I think it's important to say it right up front at the beginning. So, uh, you know, I'd like to thank uh, EDUHK for their for their support. Obviously, uh, the organizing committee, uh, the department uh, itself, and uh, special thanks to Alex, who I know uh, actually had to organize this twice. I think with once uh, with the intention of a live meeting and then uh, shifting it over to virtual. So, uh, thank you very much. Um, I just. Uh, very last quick thing, uh, just a kind of uh, note going forward for the association. Um, we're of course looking forward to getting back together live, uh, you know, as, as soon as possible. Um, I should tell you that there are some plans afoot for a joint meeting of the APPPN with a new uh, similar network, which has been created recently in the uh, Middle East and North Africa. Uh, to, so the idea is to have a joint meeting. Their annual meeting is in December in Doha. And so uh, we're hoping that uh, it might be possible uh, to, for people to actually travel there at, at that point. Uh, if not, uh, we're very hopeful that uh, next year at uh, roughly this time, we'll be able to proceed as planned with the uh, seventh meeting, which is scheduled for uh, Erlanga University in Indonesia. So uh, just with those notes, uh, I'll leave it there and, and wish everybody a good conferencing. Thank you, thank you so much, Professor Howlett. And uh, actually, being the, as the um, you know the moderator of the opening ceremony, I, I have no intention of claiming the credit of being the coordinator because there is a great hero behind the scene, and Dr. Sudut, Suduti Rawat, and she has been really instrumental in organizing and all these you know tedious logistics, you know, from A to Z. She's really you know the hero behind the scene. So, Suduti, do you want to say say a few words, please? Oh, thank you so much, Alex. And I just want to convey my thanks to 
all the panelists and everyone who is here today uh, for taking out your time. And also it's really, what was really amazing was anyone, everyone we approached for the pre-conference sessions or even for the plenary sessions, they were so gracious in that time and not even one person turned us down. So I'm really grateful for everyone's presence here. And yeah, I really look forward that we're all able to take back something of value from today and tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you so much, Studi. And I would also like to thank uh, Mr. Joni Wong, also our admin support colleague, and um, many of other, uh, you know, admin uh, colleagues. They have been really tremendously helpful in making this uh, virtual conference happen. And uh, so, as the Professor Howlett has said, you know, this virtual format of the conference has, you know, has been very challenging, you know, in, in this COVID-19 period. And uh, hope, uh, we hope, we do hope that, uh, you know, some of the rituals of physical conference can still be kept. And when, if you look at the program, when we, when we use the word break, we do mean coffee breaks. So feel free to grab a cup of coffee in your own coffee shop and keep the receipt and post that back to us. It will try to reimburse for you as much as we can, okay? Uh, so now, you know, without further ado, let's, you know, let's move to the plenary talks. Today is uh, it's our great privilege to invite three distinguished, uh, not three, three set of, you know, three groups of distinguished scholars to deliver their talks. And really many of them are re related to COVID-19 and, and, and the other the challenges of governance. So first of all, our first plenary speaker is Professor Anthony Jan, and he's currently the research chair professor of public administration at our own department at ADUHK. And Professor Jan has been a veteran you know, public sector leader. He served as the secretary for housing and transport of the Hong Kong SAR government between 2012 to 2017. And the title of his talk today is the end of the beginning or beginning of the end. Uh, facing the paradox of governance and public policy in age of crisis. So each plenary speaker will have 25 minutes uh, maximum, and because we do want to leave you know, ample time for Q&A. So Professor Zhang, please. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Uh, okay. Good morning. Uh, thank you very much, Alex, uh, for inviting me to this uh, APPPN conference. Uh, can you all see my slide? Yeah. Good. Yes, very clear. Okay. In the autumn of 1942, when encouraging news arrived about the Allies' performance at the Eastern Front and North Africa, which some saw as the turning of the hinge of fate, British Prime Minister Winston Churchill was advised to ring out the bells to celebrate the victory of Egypt. Instead, he told a Lord Mayor's conference, or luncheon rather, that this is not the end. It is not even the beginning of the end, but it is perhaps the end of the beginning. Now I'm using this quote to kick off my presentation because while the tradition of contemporary public administration since the beginning of the last century, as well as the era of new public management, MPM, that has dominated the public administration reform agenda for almost the past three decades, seem to be eroded. We are nowhere near the point of celebrating the beginning of a new dawn. We do not know what the future might hold for us, but what we should be quite certain about is that we are in a transition where the end of the beginning and the beginning of the end seem to be two sides of the same coin. We face crisis all the time. So why is this present crisis so significant? What, time, what kind of crisis is it? A fundamental change or challenge is that modern society is a risk society. Increasingly subject to all kinds of human-made manufactured risks, high-tech risks, financial risks, or catastrophes originated from nature, but induced or made worse by human action or lack of action, we are now in the middle of a major crisis characterized 
by the two C's, climate change and COVID pandemic. And crisis mutates and causes further crises across other domains. A major test of governance nowadays is the capacity to respond to and manage crisis. Governance capacity and governance legitimacy are critical to crisis management, entailing the building of organizational capacity, mobilization and coordination of public resources, as well as managing public perceptions and securing trust. This has become a tall order to, in new global circumstances where politics have changed and public administration has changed. The world has changed. Responding to a major crisis calls for close state society collaboration as well as international cooperation, both seemingly in short supply. Recognizing some mega changes is critical in defining the scale of the crisis of governance that we are now confronting. One, a world of risk and crisis, as what I've just described. Two, the decline of democracy, a kind of the end of the end of history, as well as the practice of liberal democracy is concerned. Three, the collapse of the Wilsonian politics administration paradigm as also argued by postmodern public administration, where both representative democracy and rule-based impartial public administration seem less tenable under the new political realities. Four, post-truth politics and social media, shaping and framing public perceptions and actions and fueling the rapid rise of radical populism. Five, a general crisis of trust in government institutions, business, the media, and NGOs. Six, the new normal after COVID-19, transforming personal, social, and economic life, as well as the practice of public service and public administration. And seven, the rise of Asia and alternative paths to governance as the 20th century Rusinian international order is gradually laid to rest. Three major turning points can be detected over the past three decades. Turning point number one was the ascendancy of neoliberal globalization after the fall of Soviet communism. The Washington consensus began to dominate the world after the 1998 to 2000 Asian financial crisis. Those were the heydays of NPM as a broad church for public sector reforms. Even social democratic politics in Europe and North, America, and North America embraced NPM as part of modernizing government and articulating the third way vision. Turning point number two occurred after the 2008 to nine global financial crisis. A serious backlash against globalization began to creep in as social and economic contradictions and disparities were intensified. The third way was soon in retreat. Neoliberalism was partially discredited. NPM began to demise. Turning point number three saw the surge of economic nationalism and institutional nationalism. Public trust was largely subsided, not only in government institutions. The rapid rise of right-wing populism has exposed further the failure of conventional democracy, which is now suffering a setback worldwide. The collapse of Usonian international order was accompanied by the rise of Asia and of China. I suppose most will agree that social trust is critical to public governance and indicative of social capital. There are various ways of assessing public and social trust, of course. According to the Edelman Trust Barometer, public trust has been on continuous decline across countries over the past decade. 
in its 21st, in its 2021 report, it asserts that a major, a majority of respondents believe that government leaders, business leaders, and even journalists are not trustworthy because of how COVID-19 has been handled, confidence in the institution of government has fallen drastically. Interestingly, those countries which enjoy high public trust in government are all in Asia, such as China, India, Indonesia, and Singapore. Several European countries are in the low trust zone, such as the US, UK, France, Russia, and Spain. Equally alarming is the degree of public trust does not correlate with institutionalized democracy. That explains in part the surge of radical populism that is anti-establishment. Democracy is in crisis. According to the Democracy Index comp compiled by the Economist Intelligence Unit, such a sliding trend has been, part, has been particularly acute in the past several years. Instead of hope about the future, there is now a widespread politics of fear, even in developed societies, fear of the unknown, a fear of the other, a fear of the future. Such fear is an expression of that complex combination of uncertainty, insecurity, and lack of safety, which results from the economic, social, and cultural consequences of globalization and the entanglement with national, regional, and local contexts. The politics of fear lies behind the rapid rise of populism and nativism in the US and many European countries. And I could also see that in Hong Kong here. The collapse of Rusunian international order is marked by both rules-based and non-rules-bound competition. The rise of Asia and of China, East-West rivalry, and the clash of civilization, systems, and values have become more intense. As Kishore Mababani puts it, the rise of Asia will bring about an equally significant transformation, just as the rise of the West had transformed the world in the last two centuries. He argues that for a long period, the Asians have been bystanders in world history. Now they are ready to become co-drivers. Asians have finally understood according to him, absorbed and implemented Western best practice in many areas, from free market economics to modern science and technology, from meritocracy to the rule of law. They've also become innovative in their own way, creating new patterns of cooperation not seen in the West. Then the cumulative impact of COVID-19, which by the way, is not going to end in the short future. In terms of response to the pandemic by various countries and systems, according to Bloomberg's COVID resilience ranking published in January this year, six of the top 10 performers are in Asia, namely Singapore, Taiwan, mainland China, Japan, Hong Kong, and Vietnam. Non-Asian top performers are New Zealand, Australia, Norway, and Finland, all non-mainstream Western countries. The world's most cherished democracies like the US and UK have performed most dismally. As Francis Fukuyama remarks, it is not a matter of regime type. Some democracies have performed well, but others have not. And the same is true for autocracies. The factors 
responsible for successful pandemic responses have been state capacity, social trust, and leadership. Countries with all three, a competent state apparatus, a government that citizens trust and listen to, and effective leaders have performed impressively, limiting the damage they have suffered. Unfortunately, in many parts of the world, these three elements are in deficit within their system of governance. But they are critical, not only for pandemic responses, but also for effective governance at large. Hence, a new politics is called for. COVID-19 will result in recasting the world's economic order due to huge gaps between the performance of different economies. As the economist put it last October, new winners and losers will emerge when the recovery takes place. According to the IMF, the world economy as well as the advanced economies have all suffered negative growth in 2020. The US at an estimated minus 3.4%. The Euro area, minus 7.2%. Japan, minus 5.1%. And the UK, minus 10%. China is the only major economy having positive growth at 2.3% last year. The strength of the recovery this year, that is 2021, is projected to vary significantly across countries depending on access to medical interventions, effectiveness of policy support, exposure to post-country spillovers and structural characteristics entering the crisis. And we can see from the graph here that China will continue to outperform the advanced economies significantly. COVID-19 has also transformed public expectations on the role of the state. Based on the analysis of The Economist, most countries have experienced new and bigger economic shocks, which serve to hasten changes in the economy. The long-term implications on social and economic life, as well as political and public attitudes will be of a scale larger than the global financial crisis. Governments worldwide have been forced to become interventionist. In order to keep jobs and help businesses to stay afloat, most governments, irrespective of their economic ideology, have resorted to deficit and debt financing. The risk of misguided and opportunistic interventions cannot be discarded, of course, but real politics have dictated policy choices. From now onwards, as public expectations change amid a shifting international economic order, it would be unrealistic to expect any return to the past regime. Rather than trying to restore yesterday's economy, governments have to adapt to and promote change. They must seek to create jobs and be willing to act as the insurer of last resort for household incomes as they seek bold and structural changes to avoid a premature return to fiscal austerity and tight monetary policy. All now seems geared to us bring the state back, back in. But what kind of state? Pre-existing this functional politics will continue in the meanwhile to induce new divides and discontent. Anti-globalization sentiments and populism may be getting worse. The new state is unlikely to be a state of nationalization or replication of the post-war welfare state. Trans traditional politics in support of the state are being subversive are subverted, sorry, as previously fringe parties and movements come to center stage. 
So where do we stand now? Facing the paradox of governance and public policy at this critical juncture, a number of points can be made. One, public administration and management needs a new departure. The traditional regime has lost its appeal. Two, there are growing tensions between policy based on science versus policy based on politics and contingencies, as COVID so vividly shows. Three, the world order that underpins the future of humanity is exposed to conflicting visions and interpretations. We need a rebalancing. Western civilization is no longer the singular cornerstone of governance. The rise of Asia and of the Orient has immense implications for the new era. Five, as such alternative governance and welfare models and paradigms, some emanating from Eastern experience, culture and practice may represent multiple paths to a broader sense or notion of modernity and governance in a polypolar world. Six, post COVID-19, the world is no longer the same. COVID tells us that a risk society and crisis governance now form part of the new normal. It also demonstrates how different countries and systems have responded to the COVID challenge with varying performance and strengths and weaknesses. The new normal also means that public service and management can no longer be business as usual, whether in terms of structure, process, or service delivery modes. At the same time, which is my last point here, innovation technology has been redefining the public, private, and government society interface. Responding to the crisis of the politics of fear, it is crucial to have the capacity to rebuild public trust. Here I use the points, recommendations made by the European think tank Demos in his 2017 report to illustrate my arguments. Uh, Demos suggested several ways forward. Moral leadership in response to public anxiety and fear targeted policy interventions to address the concerns about the loss of safety and security, reconnecting political elites and citizens, practicing genuine openness and diversity, and enabling their benefits to be, exper to be experienced more widely, and countering post-truth narratives in politics and the media. These are all ideas that make sense or ideals in the perfect society. However, of course, we have to be sensitive to the reality, the context of political system, institutional culture, and social traditions in different countries. We are in a highly volatile environment. At this time of reflections, an important starting point is that we have passed the stage of blind optimism about MPM, MPG, meaning new public governance, and even network governance, because these are all premised on the reformation of classical public administration, founded on conventional democracy and Wilsonian assumptions geared towards a universalist model, a kind of old wine in the labeled bottom. We have to reconstruct public governance based on the new realities and more complicated public context where diversities and disjointedness have become the norm. We have to build reconnection between elites and citizens and between state and society. To regain trust in bureaucracy and government the whole basis of governance and state society collaboration 
has to be rethought and rebuilt. Without shared vision and purpose, such collaboration, even on a wider network premise, may be more of a facade. We have to reconsider some of the past assumptions and reconceptualize our understanding of public administration and management and of state society and state economy relationships, democratic practice, public service ethos, tools of government and so on. Presently, we are facing a theoretical vacuum with a lack of reform directions and paradigms. Will readjustments and devised additions be sufficient or will more fundamental breakthroughs be needed with due regard and sensitivity to culture and traditions, as well as public perceptions and anxieties. Different systems will have to rise to the new era and its challenge differently. There is no singular model to follow, to develop and evolve. In promoting some universal values and principles, we also need to appreciate national, local differences in legacies and practices. A new era is unfolding with yet unclear paths ahead. But one thing to me may seem quite certain, the end of end of history and of one dimensional universalism. So to sum up my presentation, um, I've, I'm going to make three points. First, we are living through a transition that feels catastrophic, divisive, disruptive, and highly challenging. All assumptions no longer hold. Second, it seems the end of an era in the economic, social, political, and ideological sense. A new era is beginning to unfold for better or worse. And three, the question is, are we now at the end of the beginning or the beginning of the end of that transition? Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Chen, for this highly stimulating talk. And I think that really sets the same macro thing for further debate today and tomorrow from the statesman's perspective. So let's, you know, uh, finish all the three plenary talks before we, you know, do the Q&A. So the next speaker, the next talk will be delivered by Professor Raul Liano and, uh, and uh, Dr. Wing Shan Ken. And uh, their, uh, the title of their talk is Relationality, the Inner Life of Public policies. This sounds very philosophical. So Professor Liano is a professor at uh, School of Culture, Education and Human Development at New York University in the U.S. And Dr. Wing Shan Chen uh, currently uh, is assistant professor at the Caritas Institute of Higher Education. So Raul and uh, Wing Shan, it's your turn. Thank you. 25 minutes. Well, hello, everyone. Uh, thanks, Professor Ha and uh, Vice President Loy. Hello to everyone. Uh, Thanks, uh, my old um, co-instructor at the Lee Kuan Yew School, Professor Howlett. And uh, good to um, see everybody here. Now, um, before I, I put the slides up, I just wanted to um, acknowledge before I begin uh, my co-author, Dr. Wing Kan. She's an assistant professor at the Caritas Institute of Higher Education in, in Hong Kong. Now we decided it would be easiest for me to just present the whole paper. But just to let you know, the empirical research behind all of this was hers. And uh, Dr. Kan is here in case there are any questions about the case study. Um, and so um, just as a preface, a main area of interest of mine is um, policy analysis, which for me is finding more and richer ways of describing the nature of public policy. So uh, Husserl might put it as uh, being faithful to the thing itself. Now, um, uh, chiming in on what Dr. Jung would said, a word about the times we're in, you know, a thing about the crisis is that it allows us to see more clearly than other times what makes a policy regime work and, or not. 
it sort of magnifies everything, distills everything and, and our insights into what's wrong or right about government and society. So this is such a time. It's a good time for being scholars, but bad time for the world. So what uh, Wing and I propose and what the subject of our paper is, is that to better understand how policy works, why it doesn't work, etc., it helps to take a relational view. Going to, you know, a place uh, near to where I, I'm not in New York right now, but um, you think about what happened in New York and in the U.S. in general. One reason the pandemic was especially severe in the U.S. has to be related to the fracturing of relationships between people, between government and people, the loss of trust, as Dr. Chen was saying, the loss of the feeling of rallying around the common good. So the point is that policy is only as good as the web of relationships in which it's embedded. And so our talk today, my talk focuses on what a relational view of policy entails and how we can better analyze relationality. So, um, so another way to introduce us is um, one way to think about policy, not the only way, is as something prescriptive. It's a prescription for solving problems, delivering benefits, et cetera. Uh, policymakers see a problem, a pandemic, write policies that address the problem. So we often think of policy as something when we codify these prescriptions, whether a set of laws or rules, these are the codified rules or the text that prescribes the actions, authorities, privileges, et cetera, that we have to address these issues. Now, sometimes it becomes obvious, many times, it becomes obvious that the policies as they reveal themselves don't follow the text, don't follow the prescription. What is written as policy may not be the policy as the phenomena of policy. So as a quick aside, I recall around the middle of last year, being really concerned at the slow rate of COVID testing in the US, uh, despite formal federal policy that promised massive testing so we got to April, May, June, still lagging behind. Uh, a nationwide testing strategy was proposed by um, Jared, what's his, and then abandoned somehow for some reason and relegated to the states. And you wonder why. And then later on, I, re I recall reading an article in Vanity Fair later in the year. And it was talking about, oh, you know, there were meetings in the White House where people were strategizing that since most of the infections seem to be occurring in the democratic states, the blue states, maybe the best policy is just sit back and let it go. Now, I think of whether or not that's true, of course, it would be horrible if it were true, but quite believable, it reminds us of anomalous situations when policy is formalized is not followed. So we ask, what then is a real policy and what determines policy? So our claim, our um, suggestion in the paper is that sometimes or often we can trace the nature of policy, not to the text of the policy, but to the nature and the workings of relationships among policy actors. It's not emerging from the formal codified rules, but the working and reworking of relationships, sometimes behind the scenes, sometimes not so behind. And you can always say, well, that's always the way policy is. You know, Goffman said, there's things that happen in the front stage, things happen in the backstage, uh, or that's the way it is. It's practice, it's complex, it's implementation. And then we leave it at that. But see, as policy analysts, our, ex our, our responsibility is to do a better explanation of how and why policy emerges. And my suggestion is we should get better at describing these relationships and understanding how policy emerges from them. So let me, um, I'll share my, our PowerPoint. Uh, and, uh, okay. Uh, so before I get started on the, um, the, the matter at hand, just to point at some, advertise, some of the uh, publications, in case people are interested in light reading um, that uh, we base this work on. Um, the case study work uh, was all done by um, Professor Tan and it's in the British Journal of Social Work. The con conceptual work around relationality draws from some things, including a public 
administration research um, a review article and one in the Journal of Public Policy and a forthcoming book on relationality. Um, so, and I may refer to these as we go along. So uh, here is my working definition so far, our working definition of relationality. In the area of um, public policy, it can be understood as the generative role that relationships have in shaping and enacting policy. It's the condition in which policy as understood and practiced emerge, emerges not just from formal codified rulemaking, but from the working and reworking of relationships among a network of policy actors. So, um, and so if, if policy emerges from the working of relationships, well, what is its relationship with policy as codified? The policy that we see in the news, in the ledger, et cetera. Well, you might think of it as something of anything from, it could be a, 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 a landscape of different relationships. But one way to think about it is it can be something where the relational is co-constitutive with the more formal codified policy um, public administration scholars will be familiar with the uh, idea of relational contracting. Now, this is where, yes, there is a formal contract, but the contract is just sort of a springboard. The contract just says, we'll establish a relationship between two parties, and the parties will resolve to agree to work out the specs of the contract between them. So much of the policy or contract isn't spelled out in code, in the contract, it's, it emerges from the working relationship between these two parties. So in that case, you can think of these things as co-constitutive, um, but you can go to the other extreme where the rules sort of give way to the relationships. And in this case, the rules start to even become epiphenomenal. Um, you know, uh, a good example of this is a paper of mine I did years ago looked at a con conservation program on the turtle islands in the Philippines. The program what had to do with the biologists were to go, the government biologists were to go to the island and conserve eggs, preserve the habitat, etc. You know, prevent poaching of eggs, etc. So the form of policy was like that. But when we look deeper and talk to the biologists and the islanders, what they said was something was. Okay, well, that's what the policy says. What we really do is we work with the islanders. You know, they have to survive on the sale of eggs. So we help them harvest the eggs, but we do it in a sustainable way. So we're trying to maintain the habitat and maintain the survival on the islands at the same time. Well, this never shows up in any acknowledged policy. And so when you talk to them and they describe how the relationship works out, it's a multitude of practices. And so in that situation, the rules sort of give way to the real policy becomes an epiphenomenon to the relationships. So, okay, I wanted to, before we get into the richer case study, just introduce two very quick examples of um, what, how relation, relationality works. And one is from Bourdieu. Uh, Pierre Bourdieu in this book Introduction to the Theory of Practice talked about um, gift exchange among the Kabila in uh, Morocco. And he said, you know, this is an interesting institution, gift exchange. It's not simply party A gives a gift to party B and B gives the equivalent back. No, if, if you did that, it would be perfunctory. Party A would be insulted if it were immediate and equivalent. No, the gift has to be somehow spontaneous and deferred. It cannot be something that you reduce to a codified rule because then it would, <clears throat> it would not be a gift. It would be sort of paying back a loan. And so how do you describe this, this practice of gift exchange? Well, I think he said in you know, better words than me, you cannot codify it. To codify it would to destroy, be to destroy the, the deception of the institution. To understand the policy of gift exchange, you have to understand the relationship between giver and receiver. Is it 
elder person, younger person, etc., friend, et cetera. and you have to understand the relationship with the individuals. So that's that's one uh, quick example from Bourdieu. The other example, I just very briefly, I wanted to point out is I was just struck not long ago. I was looking in a, a particular city. No need to mention the city. It's not Hong Kong, by the way. And I was looking at the uh, real estate taxes in the city. And I said, wow, taxes are so great, are so big. It's incredible. And if you sell property, the value added tax, you know, this, uh, capital gains tax, et cetera, all the fees, it's incredible. Why would anyone invest in real estate? It doesn't make sense for the investor to buy a piece of property. And then I, I, at some point it came, became clear to me, you know, many people, perhaps a majority of people don't pay the actual fees. What happens is that the code in this case is a pretext. It's a pretext for someone then to go and talk with people in the assessor's office, the inspectors, et cetera, to work out the real fees. The real schedule of fees is not what appears in the code. So in this case, the formal policy is a pretext for the working of the relationships in the backstage. The point is that relationships determine what gifts are given, what taxes are paid, et cetera. And we can use the analogy of gift exchange maybe for many public policy situations. But then this gets us thinking, if we're gonna describe policy as the working out of relationships, how do we then describe relationships and relate it to policy? This is the difficulty, which by the way, I haven't solved. You know, it's social network analysis looks at constellations of relationships. But so far, the most that, you know, we've gone to the extent with social network analysis is depicting a relationship as a zero one variable. You either link or not. But what I, we're suggesting is we have to probe deeper and more richly describe what a relationship is and then work out how it affects policy. My talk won't be, this talk won't be so much about that, but in brief, there are attempts, and I might point to some uh, public administration literature, Stout and Love, talk about the ontological nature of relationality, uh, uh, Bartels and Turnbull, etc. cetera. Um, my colleagues and I have been working on, first, let's try to describe a relationship, let's say between taxpayer and tax assessor. Well, it turns out that a lot of what a relationship is, is bound up in one's identity, but it's not simply who I am. It's simple way to think about it is a three dimensional one, who I am, the constitution of my own identity, but it's also who I am vis-a-vis -vis the other, and then who I am with the other, self and other as a joint entity. And somehow, if you can imagine it, trying to get someone to describe relationships has to do with this. Well, who, who is she or he to you? How do you interact? What is your relationship? And it, it's, it's very difficult to try and draw out the story from a person, but this is ethnography after all. So, okay. Um, and please, anyone wants to interject with a comment or question, I'm happy to because I'm just rambling on. And uh, I wanted to get quickly before I used up the 25 minutes into the case study that uh, Professor Kan uh, did the work on. Um, it has to do with uh, vouchers, the use of vouchers in Hong Kong. Now, um, the uh, the idea stems from Milton Friedman. You have a public program in Hong Kong. We're gonna talk about programs for assisting the elderly and uh, living in place. Now, Milton Friedman says, you know, there are built-in inefficiencies in these public programs. A voucher can turn a public program into sort of a quasi-private market. A voucher simply is a certificate the person has, it's a money value certificate, and they can use it to purchase services for themselves or education or whatever the voucher is designed to do. And it, it brings in this uh, idea of market uh, forces. You know, um, on the demand side, the person now becomes a consumer. 
I make an informed choice and I use the vow to choose among all these options to be, and I optimize the choice according to what's best for me. Who knows after all what's best for herself or himself, but the person himself or herself. On the supply side, it creates these forces where there is now a competition between providers because if I'm a bad provider, no one will come to me. So it provides uh, incentives for entry of private providers into the market and a competition for the better uh, providers. Now there's the magic of the policy is that the voucher sort of works in an auto autonomic way that it reduces the burden on the state of figuring out for this person, what's the best service for this person, whether it's a school or set of services, you know, uh, health services, et cetera. And the choice now becomes one on the part of the client or the consumer. It works like a market and ideally the, cl the client, the consumer is like looking into a vending machine. Oh, all these options, what's my best option? I'll press this button. There's, there's the uh, product. Now we're informed by uh, people like Mark Granovetter. Markets don't really work exactly like that. And in fact, markets are embedded in social relations. Now the, the, um, the insight that we bring to it is it's not just an embedding. What if the market functions primarily because of the social relations or in some cases the, the relations supplant the market? It becomes epiphenomenal. And so this brings us to the question of how do we then represent the policy, the relationships behind the policy? How do we analyze it? And how do we show how the relationships leads to the policy, crafts and shapes it? Um, so here's the um, case study. And again, any difficult questions, please direct it to uh, Professor Kan. Um, Hong Kong in recent decades has been undergoing a profound demographic shift. So there arose this program, it's called the Vouchers for Community Care Services, and it's meant to support aging in place. That supporting um, older persons, senior citizens of living in their own homes, thriving, managing, you know, they're retired and everything, but you know, being productive and it's meant to support that kind of a lifestyle. The backdrop is uh, Hong Kong has, uh, well, this is a good thing, high life expectancy in the world now, more than 88 years for women, more than 82 years for men. But this changing demographic also means that uh, older persons are becoming an increasing proportion of the population. It grew eight to 8, 18%. And in the next 20 years, it'll be 33% of the population there are other things happening too. Of that um, second, the uh, community of uh, the older generation, 65 and older, 16, no, no, is it 18% of them actually live alone? So society is changing as we speak. And for the government of Hong Kong, it's increasing pressure on long term care uh, services for aging in place which has been traditionally what they call subvented, it's all public programs run and financed by the state and paid for by taxes and property taxes, et cetera. This burden on the state is difficult. And so they came up with the idea of if we introduce a market instrument, it may allow for a more efficient matching of services to needs and a better incentive for more private providers because the state figured out it can't provide everything. And also the state figuring it out for the, for the client is difficult because the way it's done traditionally is the state creates these community centers where people can go for nursing services, rehab, et cetera. And they, they assign it to different districts in Hong Kong. And if you live here, you're assigned to there, but you're limited to that place, to the service they provide. And government can cope with, you know, just let people do what they want. But if we had a voucher, and we allowed people, it empowered people to do it. Maybe this will free up and, and reduce the burden on government and actually make from a more efficient system. So the research had to do with, um, well, first, uh, again, some details about it. The voucher in the beginning, phase one, first three years for the lower income bracket was 5,800 Hong Kong dollars per month. 
Now, if you had more money and you wanted more and better services, you can top it up and pay out of your own pocket extra. And you can purchase any combination of services that you want. The idea behind the voucher was, well, this is part of aging in place. We're not making decisions for our clients. They're consumers now, and we're supporting informed choice, autonomy. They don't want to rely on the state, and so they can be independent and optimize the spectrum of services that they receive. And uh, of course, these market instruments, same thing with insurance, carbon taxes, et cetera. They're most effective when they're universal, when everybody takes advantage of the voucher. All the eligible elderly, a million, more than a million in Hong Kong. And here's the problem that the study of uh, during phase one said that, you know, almost half, 43% of the eligible senior citizens opt out of the program. They find they don't want the voucher. And so this became a problem. And so what is the research um, that Wing uh, did? Well, it was uh, had, had to do with talking with these clients, the customers with the voucher programs, but in two groups. She um, uh, found 53 senior citizens uh, through these NGOs, 26 of them persisted with the voucher, found use for it. 27 said, I can't use this voucher, I'll opt out. And in addition, interviewed also 16 social workers and professionals, some nurses. And the idea was, what happened when you tried to use the voucher? And you know, a lot of the research was looking at outcomes of the voucher program, but this one looked at process. What was the process of using the voucher? What was your experience? Why did it work for you? Why did it not work for you? So in a nutshell, what were the findings of the study? Well, first of all, simply providing the market instrument, the voucher, seems to be not enough for a lot of people to make an informed choice. And basically one way the, their paper can enjoy, their paper describes it is, you can think of the voucher as financial capital. I have this certificate, I can use it to purchase any services anywhere. But it turns out using this voucher required other forms of capital, as Bourdieu might say, multiple forms of capital, social, institutional, cultural capital, none of which actually we tend to consider when we create such a market instrument. To illustrate this, this is a figure from the paper. Um, this is for um, Wendy, is a pseudonym from one of the groups that, uh, the group that successfully, that liked the voucher program. And so this just depicts, uh, she was able to successfully use the voucher, but on the strength of these relationships with family members on top, with professionals and social workers, and the bottom with her own peer group. And so um, just as an example of what the interview is like, and you get so much text, this much text out of an interview, let me read just one snippet. Without our help, I don't think our, my mom would use the service because she doesn't want to give herself and others trouble, she prefers staying home. Finally, we encourage her to use the service. We accompanied, we accompanied her to the visit the center, make her feel safe and comfortable. Now she's using it, she can connect with the community make some friends instead of staying home, et cetera. It goes on and on. There's a lot in this interview. And if you look at what the social workers talking about or what, how they talked about the social workers role, it turns out that there's a lot that goes into using this voucher in this very complex system. And really a person that success, successfully uses a voucher has to draw on these other resources, multiple forms of capital, which are after all, relationships. So um, to conclude the case study, so we see here how in some cases a policy rises and falls based on the uh, relationships that underpin it. it. The relationships can determine whether the policy works, how the policy works, and in some cases when the relationships dominate, 
the relationships are the policy. And so as policy scholars, if we want to be true to our calling, then we should be better able to incorporate relationality in our analysis. Because I can say, and of course we all can say that of course relationships matter in public policy. We've always known that. Uh, Harold Laswell knew that and we know that. But how about if we begin thinking about how do we explicitly capture and describe relationship? And some people we may try to model it, not just as zero one binary variables, but in more of its richness and try to explain how policy comes about through that. And some of the analysis must be able to, like in this British Journal of Social Work paper, uh, peer into how this network of relationships works by activating multiple forms of capital, multiple relationships. And, and there's also something about this idea of a relational approach to policy. I've been talking about it as something in a descriptive sense. But there's a prescriptive notion of it too, that when we take a relational view, we can also start thinking about what is this policy regime needing? What needs to be healed in this? What people are need, or do we need to draw into policy making, policy implementation, and why are they not part of it at this time? So thinking about creating or, or reconfiguring constellations of relationships may be part of the way we think about policy. So let me end it there and, um, uh, and uh, we can talk more about it uh, in um, later on. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Liano, and for this very nicely packaged qualitative study based in Hong Kong context. So our third uh, talk will be given by Professor Richard Walker and his team, together with uh, Dr. Edmund Chen and, uh, and Mr. Jia Shun Chang. And uh, uh, the Professor Walker has been a kind of giant in championing you know, experimental research method in public policy and other methodological innovations, which are all you know, state of the field, you know, uh, fancy stuff. And so the title of the talk today is Knowledge Illusion, Com Community of Knowledge and Citizens' Extreme Attitudes in Politics and Public Policy. So Professor Walker, please. Thank you very much, Alex. Um, thank you for the invitation today, and thanks for the organization, and particularly the coordination by study has been very, uh, very helpful. Um, the title is actually slightly shorter now, the last one was a little bit long, so uh, we, we've retitled all this political extremism is not supported by an illusion um, of, of understanding. Um, the work is a collaborative effort uh, between myself and Edward Zhang who's in the Department of Public Policy, he runs the Political Analysis Lab, uh, and together he and I um, take a leading role in the Center for Public Affairs and Law. Uh, and Jason Zhang is, uh, works in the Laboratory for Public uh, Management uh, and, and Policy. So uh, a bit like Raoul, this is a collective effort I'm presenting, they're answering as we, as we move forward. Um, we have heard from Anthony and uh, Raoul about extremity. The world has become more divided, social, economic, uh, political views, um, and so forth. We see more, we see more uh, unrest in the world. So, so division maybe is part of, you know, Anthony's, the new normal, how, how, and then how do we address this um, becomes a central issue um, that, that we need to, we need to explore. What we do in this study is draw on cognitive science. And this offers a valuable lens to, to understand the formation of and, and change in citizens' extreme attitudes. For, for this study, we're particularly interested in that it shows that people tend to overestimate the quality of their own judgments and the depth of their explanatory knowledge in regard to many complex social issues. Um, phenomena, this phenomena, um, scholars have called the, the knowledge illusion. So there is a knowledge illusion. People are overestimating their knowledge on, on, on particular issues. So the knowledge illusion can also be shaped by obtaining relevant information from various communities of knowledge, friends, community leaders, experts, online communities. So where do you get your knowledge from can influence uh, potentially your, your, your knowledge illusion. 
So as we move forward, questions arise about how we moderate this ex extremism. So that's our, our context for this study. We wondered if we found a solution to this in, in some ways, a way to puncture this illusion of understanding or the knowledge illusion that, that people carry too much knowledge. So in 2013, um, Fernback, Rogers, Fox and Solomon um, published an article titled Political Extremism is Supported by an Illusion um, of Understanding. Their main argument, the illusion of understanding, people believe that they have a greater depth of understanding about something they truly do. This confronts people with their lack of procedural policy knowledge, um, which will moderate their political extremism. So if we confront people about their procedure, their details, their understanding, of a policy, will that moderate their political, uh, political extremism or extremism towards that policy? So that's the central argument that was put forward in this paper. How did they do this? Uh, I will describe as we go through, but they had two main inter interventions. So this was a, a, an experimental study. They used a mechanistic explanation. Please describe all the details that you know about the policy area. I'll come to describe these later going from the first steps to the last and providing the causal connection between the steps. So that this is the idea of procedurally challenging people's understanding of a particular policy. Um, the second thing they did was, was slightly more simple. They asked people just to write down all the reasons you have for your position for or against, going from the most important to the least. So one is, the first is trying to get people to causally engage and think through and understand um, a policy, so it could be, it could be voucher schemes in Hong Kong. Um, the second is just to list out um, your, your views on the topic. The paper has had <coughs> some uh, influence, it was reasonably well cited um, in Google Scholar. Uh, around the time of its publication, there were media reports in the New York Times or on national public radio um, in the US. Um, this is uh, Ben back of giving a, a TED talk um, on, on, the, on this topic a, a few years ago. And we've seen this study actually influence practice and policy. So in the UK, uh, the greater, in Greater Manchester, um, there was a preventing hateful extremism um, promoting social cohesion commission, um, which reported on, on ways to address these issues uh, and cited this study um, in part of that. Uh, the Kennedy School there's a journalist resource on, on policy related issues. And again, this is cited as some useful, uh, useful resource for people to use. So um, an article with some impact. Excuse me. So what we have done is to replicate this, uh, replicate this study. Um, first off, this study, as I said, is a, uh, it was a, a, an experiment, uh, a vignette methodology experiment or a survey experiment. So the design is reasonably internally robust, um, looking at the paper um, and, and aspects of, of what they did. Um, but with, with most research, we have a trade-off between internal validity and external validity. Um, uh, often a, a presumption that the, the higher the internal validity, so if you take a lab experiment, you can have very high internal validity um, for our design. But how does that stack up for its external validity as you move it out in, into the real, the real world? So these are the, the, the balances um, that, we're, that we're looking at in, in the study. I'll return to this in a minute. But something, uh, the bottom point here, we've been running a number uh, of replications uh, maybe for the last five six or, or, or more more years in in hong kong this was partly driven by the open science movement so the, this movement towards greater transparency in our research and you know, data availability um, pre-registration um, of research designs but also of replication and so there are very strong examples, particularly from social psychology, where there was the inability to replicate studies. So that comes back down to questions of external validity from very strongly with studies with very strong internal in, internal validity. But that's been found in finance, um, in, in economics, in, in finance. It was 
often simply the inability to replicate a study based on the original data. Um, um, but clearly the, the social psychology studies, some, one of the more famous ones was, was, on, was on hand washing um, uh, and achieving routines in hand washing that couldn't be replicated. So the open science movement uh, has sought to replicate uh, many, many studies uh, and they are struggling to get past 50, 60 percent, no, struggling to get to, I think, 50, 60 percent replicability, the ability to replicate those studies. So this is sort of part of the, the agenda um, that, that, that uh, we're, we're working with, um, but our decision was to replicate the, the Fernback study. Um, what, uh, what we're doing here, the replication is relatively uh, complex. No study can actually be completely replicated. Uh, if, we, if we repeat um, a, 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 a lab experiment two days later, it's two days later. Things um, can have, think can have changed people's responses. Uh, maybe it may be different. But what we can achieve, uh, and sorry, if we're thinking about replication, we have our, our populations, the subjects we're looking at, and the measurement uh, and analysis. Um, so that the, the, as near to a direct replication, will be use the same population, the same citizens in Hong Kong, and citizens in, in the US, and the same measurement of analysis. So that, that, that's a, a direct replication. Clearly, when we work in Hong Kong, um, part of what drives our agenda is that much of the theory, particularly in public administration, is derived from the West. We're in, in an Eastern context. Um, so there are questions about the applicability of that. So we were, we're testing aspects of that. So in effect, here we, uh, as a minimum, we're doing empirical generalizations because we are working with, this, with a different population, even if we're using the same uh, measure, measurement uh, and, uh, and analysis. If we start to change the measurement of analysis, and um, we're, we're moving away, so here we're moving away from the, the original study, there's an increasing, an increasing distance in what we're doing. And we're involved in either a conceptual replication if we're extending the measurement or a, a generalization and extension if we're using different populations and, and, and different, different measurements. What we've sought to do as much as possible here um, in the study is an empirical generalization, so trying to use um, the treatments um, and the design of the original study. There have been, before this, published two uh, replications um, of Fernback's um, study uh, and both failed to replicate. Um, the first um, by Rockall, Brandon, Colombo um, was a generalization and extension, so that moved the original study some way from its original core. But, but they weren't able to replicate some of the, the core findings here. I'll come to the findings in a minute. And another study by Crawford, which was a, as di a direct study as possible in that he used the same policy topics, there's the same um, people, the, public, the citizen, citizens of the, the US, but there were failures to replicate there. So there's some questions. The, this could be methodological, um, as we'll talk about in a minute. The, the, uh, the sample sizes are still relatively small. So there are questions about the statistical power um, within the models. There are questions about the research designs. These were within subject um, experiments. So respondents were asked about a number of different policy areas. So there's a question of whether there is a, a framing and le learning process that takes place within that. As we'll come back to later, there, there are questions about the, the bounded conditions of the theory or whether in fact alternative theories better explain policy and political extremism. So these are the study designs on the, the left hand side is the original study and, and here is our original, uh, sorry, here is our replication. So I'll just talk through this. So I said the first study was conducted in the US, it used Amazon's Mechanical Turk um, for subjects. Our studies clearly in Hong Kong uh, and we used a company called Dynata uh, and their online panel. The original study looked at six policy areas, um, sanctions on Iran, social security, healthcare, carbon emissions, tax, uh, and merit-based pay. Excuse me. In Hong Kong, we looked at universal suffrage in the, whoops, sorry, in the basic law, the election uh, of the chief executive. We looked at 
land supply policy, and we looked at same-sex marriage policy. So there are the three policy areas we selected. As I mentioned, the original study was within subject to design. We changed this to a, a, a between subject design so that each subject only saw one of these policy options, not, not multiple ones. We also added a control um, to the study um, because we were shifting to a, a between study design. The original manuscript ha had three um, experiments. The first just looked at the mechanistic explanations, the detail by itself. So we discounted that and moved to the second study where they compare mechanistic explanations um, with enumerating reasons. So the detailed explanation uh, and the listing out. Um, so that was our, our, our first replication. Um, the, experiment, the third experiment uh, asked similar things, but then asked about the willingness of people to make donations to the policy area they were discussing. So it's a simple binary question, would you donate? So again, we replicated that experiment um, in, in Hong Kong. But as I mentioned um, in the introductory, my introductory words, where your knowledge comes from may have influence. So we included a new additional um, experiment with the same uh, treatment, so that mechanistic uh, uh, um, enumerating reasons, but looked at sources of knowledge. So we asked people to, to think about a source of knowledge to see whether that had an influence. So the different sources of knowledge influence if it's elites, friends, um, and, and, and so forth. So our measurements um, and our analytical technique, um, our treatments, I mentioned we had a control group. Here subjects were just asked only to rate the policy. Uh, I'll come to the dependent variable in a moment. We included, as we said, the mechanistic explanation. So ask them to explain the mechanisms underlying the, the policy, trying to give a causal explanation. The enumeration to list out the reasons why they support these uh, policies. So just a, so just, a, just a list. The dependent variable is position extremity. Um, so well, it's not quite a, So th this was a, a seven point scale. Um, one would be strongly against the seven strongly in favor of the policy. Um, but we're just interested in extremity. So it could be for or against. Um, so we then just subtracted four to get a range from zero to three with the highest score um, in indicating more extreme attitudes to, towards the policy. So for the, the second experiment, we have this question about political donation. So that was just a simple yes, no, are, are you willing to donate to this particular cause, trying to, to get, see how strong, as it were, there their views were in, in terms of a hypothetical desire to donate. We did try to explore to make a real donation, but, but that proved a little complicated. Um, we used some covariates. We asked about the subject's understanding of the policy. Seven, mean they, seven indicating they had a, a greater understanding of the policy. We asked about the political parties they support. We, we uh, ad, identified the 17 and parties, and we categorize those into pro-establishment, pro-democracy, and pro-localist. So we had three, three groups here. We asked about gender, uh, male or female, and age as a, a continuous variable. And we included an attention check to make sure that given this is a survey experiment, people weren't just clicking through um, the, the survey uh, randomly. So what do we find? The original study, um, we're, we're focusing on experiment two, so, so the difference between the mechanistic and the enumerating uh, reasons. In the original study, they found political extremity decreased when people were asked to causally outline how a policy worked and found no impact um, in political extremity in the enumerating, region, re, enumerating reasons. For experiment three, they were one for political donation. Uh, generating mechanistic explanations reduce donations to, to relevant political advocacy groups. So thinking about this, we reduced further their political extremity. 
in Hong Kong, we, we substantially increased the sample sizes. So in total, I think we have seven, 8,000 subjects um, in this study to ensure we have strong um, statistical power. So a, a methodological improvement we made. And we found the opposite. So we do not, uh, we weren't, weren't able to support the original conclusions. So political extremity increased following mechanistic and enumerating reasons. So it doesn't matter whether people were asked to simply, sorry, or were asked to simply list or, or, or to, to, to describe in a causal way the policy. When we compare that to the control, we find it increases. So just quickly, um, the charts um, range, um, Median is, is the line 75, 25 percentiles. The red dots are the means. So we can see that from the control group where they're, they're just asked their view on the policy, no, no explanation. We see an increase in means, an increase in medians um, for the two. The differences between the control and the two uh, explanations um, uh, are statistically significant. With a, oh. Huh. My PowerPoint crashed. Let me try again. Um, just bear with me a second. Okay, is that okay again? Very good, please go on. So the, the computer doesn't like the story. Um, so the, the, sorry, where was it? The, the two explanations that are, are, are with an anaerobic test are, are significantly different from the control, but there is no difference between the two, the two explanations. For the second experiment, um, when we asked subjects if they were willing to donate to a relevant political advocacy group, again, we see an increase. So I won't report those, those differences. And then we asked about different sources of knowledge, we find no results. So this, this is a, a standard horrible PowerPoint table, but the issue to look at is this here, all the NSs. So we, we had a control, we asked about sources from the internet, community leaders, experts, and friends. Um, the, the F scores are weak here for land supply and across the policy areas. But critically, when we run the post hoc tests to look at where the details are in, in terms of differences across those groups, we, we, we find nothing. We also conducted some covariate analysis based on the, the, the additional measures uh, I mentioned a, a, few, a few minutes ago. We asked about policy understanding. Um, and interesting, we found a positive and statistically significant correlation between policy understanding and position extremism um, in the control um, and in the mechanistic explanations and reasonings. Um, but the interventions increased uh, again, but did not decrease policy understanding. So we're seeing a, a relationship here, which is implying understanding as a, as a positive effect on this. We looked at some of the covariates um, that we had in here. Um, higher position extremity for females, people aged over 41, and people who expressed support for pro-establishment political, political parties, across all three um, of the policy areas we were looking at, the basic law, uh, land supply, uh, uh, and LGBT issues. We used robustness checks, um, using the attention check to, to, to filter out people who may be we're not answering that robustness uh, attention check properly uh, and our, our results our results still stand. So what does this all mean? Um, we, we, we might need a little bit of help you know, with some interpretation as we, we move forward with this. Um, for, for the replication, 
Um, there may be questions about the original study. Mthurpsat and Turk samples um, have been shown to be somewhat liberally screwed, skewed, so that may have a, an impact on the original study. As I mentioned within the original study, it was a within subjects design, which may lead to possible learning effects uh, and transfer across conditions, because people are seeing multiple um, of these policy options. For us, we, we, we involve some, some extensions, subjects in a different context, and the, the, different, the different policy areas. Universal suffrage in the basic law, land supply for housing, same-sex marriage policy. So there's a question in Hong Kong, are views more deeply embedded on these topics? So is our topic selection here perhaps influencing the results? We increase the M from hundreds to thousands. So we're fairly confident um, that just the differences in means that we have uh, are, are, are meaningful uh, over the other over the other studies. And as I mentioned, we have a, a between subjects design. It's maybe that alternative theories need exploring, political misperceptions. These are typically rooted in sort of directionally motivated reasoning, um, which limits the effectiveness of, of corrective information interventions on, on controversial issues. So while political elites are constantly more informed than the public across a wide range of controversial issues, an increase in the accuracy of information does not reduce belief polarization or disagreement in public policy. So perhaps this is something that, that we should be exploring in, in future. Another area is perhaps about self-motivated thinking. And this means that people tend to think about things they want, but do not have. Um, attitudes associated with unattained goals are likely to receive more, uh, thorough than, more thought than our attitudes not associated with, with unattained goals. So perhaps we can explore alternative uh, ways to look at this. As I was mentioning just before, perhaps we should replicate our study again um, and look at interventions that or policy areas that are perhaps not seen as quite as controversial. Um, is this um, the, uh, a function um, of the, the areas we have studied? And another methodological change could be um, to look at anchoring vignettes, clear, clearly people's interpretations um, uh, of uh, the way uh, vignettes are presented, the, the way people interpret questions is, is an issue. The, the more technical side of this is, is measurement um, equivalence, um, but anchoring vignettes is a way we could look at this as well. What might this mean for Hong Kong? Um, if we're Confident in, in our results, the empirical evidence shows that it will be difficult to attenuate policy extremism in the policy making process in Hong Kong by focusing on the illusion of knowledge and communities of knowledge. So these two concepts may not have as much applicability as we'd hoped when we commence this study. Alternative uh, consultation mechanisms may be required to allow uh, different knowledge communities to engage in frequent um, and reciprocal interactions with citizens to demonstrate that reasoned deliberation uh, will be rewarded. Uh, this may mitigate the influences of misinformation uh, or established narratives, which is sort of what Anthony were, were sort of, I think, alluding to um, in, in the, the, towards the end of his presentation. And our last point is that perhaps digitally enabled um, and cross-sectoral platforms could be explored to engage and inform citizens about the complexity of policy design and implementation and to adjust, adjust uh, cognitive biases on less controversial uh, policy issues. So that is us done, as they say. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Walker, for this highly, you know, exciting talk and methodologically and, you know, substantially. So uh, now the floor is open. We have plenty of time, you know, for Q&A and any sort of interaction. So for, you know, attendees, you're most welcome to type. I'm not sure whether you can unmute yourself, but feel free to type in the in the chat box in the Q and A, uh, you know, in the, the, the box, and then um, you know the speakers will respond. So, so speakers, I think it's you know takes time for for the attendees to to warm up. So, um, Professor Howlett, could I invite you to say a few words, you know, in response to these three talks? 
Sure. Um, I hope that uh, Mike is back on. You can hear that. But uh, uh, yes, no, I mean, these are, are, are very interesting uh, talks. I mean, all three. And uh, although they have, I mean, extremely different methodologies and, and so on, uh, they, they absolutely interact with each other in, in some very interesting ways. Um, I, rather than talk about those interactions, which I think would be, would be really interesting. I mean, I, I actually had sort of more specific questions for, for each of the authors. And so let me just throw those out. Um, for, for Anthony, I mean, I think this, this question of, you know, what is the nature of the post-COVID world and what does it look like is absolutely critical. I mean, that's the, the key issue, you know, of the moment. And I was just wondering why um, in most of your paper, uh, you were looking at the changes at the kind of level of the nation or the nation state. And it would, it would seem to me that, that you may get a very uneven pattern across countries and that, that perhaps the basic unit analysis to look at would be the sector rather than, than the nation. So I'm just, I don't know if you have any comments on that. Um, for, for Raul, uh, I had posted something to the chat list and, and he's responded to that. So I'd, I'd encourage the attendees to take a look at it. But um, I was intrigued by the way that uh, Raul's paper fit with Anthony's or might fit with Anthony's. And again, also relate back to this theme of what does the post COVID world look like and how can we understand it? So the question I had had was, it, was whether or not uh, the pandemic has altered uh, the kinds of relationships that existed in the pre pandemic period in a way which is uh, understandable and sort of predictable uh, in the post COVID period. And Rule had, had one comment on that. Um, for, uh, for Richard, uh, again, another very interesting presentation. In, in the conclusion, the slide that you had where you'd mentioned about uh, embeddedness, uh, that struck me as being potentially very important. And so I'm just wondering, you know, if you could elaborate a little bit about what, what that means and how you think that that happens. The reason I'm asking is because it seems to me that the findings that you have would sort of fit with, um, you know, at least the hypothesis anyway, that, uh, you know, deeply embedded or deeply held, strongly held positions when there's additional information, you know, it just adds to the strength of, of that position, which is already held. So it's a kind of motivated reasoning uh, approach. Whereas uh, a more kind of learning activity would only occur when the position was less strongly held. So then as additional information comes in, it may or may not reinforce what's actually there. Um, so is, is that what you're getting at with, the, with embeddedness? Is that what you mean by embeddedness? And, and if so, it strikes me that may be uh, quite important. Who answers first? Anthony? Maybe I'll try to uh, respond to Michael's uh, general question. I think um, in working out my presentation, what I have in mind is what kind of uh, uh, turning point or crisis we are in. So I try to uh, bring different crises uh, together. So COVID, of course, is what uh, dominates many people's mind at the moment. And in a way, COVID has exposed the other crisis. It's, it, it sort of um, opened the box <laughs> for us to examine, to reflect on. And, um, but it's not just COVID, because COVID could, could be understood at different levels. It could be understood in terms of the resilience of whatever system we have, it could be understood as how we respond to uh, a, a challenge, a risk uh, in ways that may not be as conventional as before because the new things, I mean, we have never experienced a, a pandemic that lasts so long and is so widespread and has created so much change around us. And it's also um, the uh, international order now, that has nothing to do with COVID in a way, but COVID has exposed the problems. Uh, uh, the way I look at it at the moment, we are not responding to COVID. I mean, the world is not responding to COVID 
as well as what the world did uh, 10 years ago when facing the global financial crisis. Because at that time, there was more international cooperation. This time, we don't have international cooperation as such. I mean, just look at the EU, the question of vaccines. <laughs> There's so, so much conflict within, even within the EU, not to mention between US and China and, and so, so forth. So I started to think, okay, what's wrong with us? What's wrong with governance? Because governance is not something isolated from the uh, international geopolitics. It's not something isolated from uh, local politics. I mean, even um, uh, I'm digressing a little bit, even in terms of extremism, uh, Richard study has found that perhaps the, 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 that particular study that he mentioned could not be replicated in Hong Kong. I would imagine that probably extremism has its own sort of national local characteristics. So we are, because it has different cultural context, cognitive context, which might be different from the kind of extremism experienced elsewhere. So, I, I, so when, when I reflect on the issue, Yes, I'm looking beyond the city, I'm looking beyond the country, more regional, more international. And I'm wondering whether the past and the 20th century, the kind of thinking, the kind of uh, paradigm building has been based on ultimately we are one world. And that oneness implies a lot of uh, commonalities, universalism. I'm not denying common features because we have more uh, multinational flows, exchange. So I'm not denying that commonality. And at the same time, I think probably we have not paid enough attention to traditions, to cultures. Of cultures and traditions, they do evolve, they do travel. But I'm wondering whether uh, in this increasingly more um, multipolar world where uh, Different countries, they, I mean, as a matter of fact, I'm not trying to explain the why, but as a matter of fact, they do things just so differently. And they respond to things so differently. That may have to do with their politics, that may do with their cultures, their cognitive perspectives, um, but that forms part of the reality. So, so based on that uh, sort of reality, I'm wondering, okay, is the uh, intellectual foundation that underpins uh, 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 the kind of understanding of public administration, the kind of understanding of governance, uh, still uh, largely valid. Because we face a lot of questions, a lot of question marks that we are not able to address at the moment. So my presentation, instead of providing answers. I mean, it's just giving some uh, points for, for thought, for reflections. Uh, are we being too, or have we been uh, too uh, simple-minded in the past that, well, there is this model and uh, of course, very prescriptive ones. Therefore, once we reach that uh, ultimate point, then things are, are, are fine. Uh, so to that extent, I, I also would echo Rao's point about what lies behind policy, right? I mean, he points to relation, importance of relations. Of course, relations have not been ignored entirely in policy studies in the past, uh, but it's more in terms of policymakers, different kinds of policymakers. So you have in the US with the Iron Triangle, or in our literature, the policy network uh, conceptualization. But I suppose, while I think you are more pointing to policy as practice at the micro level. So recipients, clients, and providers, that kind of micro sort of policy practice. So relations there is as important as uh, at the more macro uh, systemic level. And, um, and Talking on that, I think perhaps we could uh, have a, uh, a further uh, view on policy because as the literature has, uh, has already told us, I mean, we have policy as intended uh, uh, statements, policy as effect, as really practiced on the ground. And uh, 
I think um, probably in our research so far, I'm, I'm talking to research at large, we have always been uh, taking the position that as a policy analyst, now there are two ways of looking at a policy. One, as an analyst. So we try to think, okay, what might be the more rational scientific way of dealing with the problem? And then it's a small prescriptive and you, you use that kind of prescription to compare and contrast with what is actually done, the real policy. And then we find the difference, we try to explain the difference or we try to critique the difference. At the same time, we try to look at the policymakers. Okay, that, what kind of interest they have, what kind of uh, uh, tendency, intellectual uh, perspectives they have, and then try using that to look at the policy. I think perhaps uh, it's time that we pay uh, increasing attention to two things. First, policy made at the decision point. What are the factors at that particular point in time? Not as a process, not as a general response to a problem. The particular po po decision point, what are the factors in place? So that's one, one, one thing. Secondly, and this is an inspiration I draw from criminal investigation. Uh, I, I watch a movie uh, and then one of the quotes was, I mean, this uh, seasoned criminal telling the cops, he said, you cops, you look at crimes from the perspective of how the cops understand the criminals, but you are not a criminal because the criminal uh, do things quite differently. The criminal think differently from the cops. So I think, yeah, I'm, I'm not saying that could be easily replicated, <laughs> but my point is, okay, maybe it's time that we uh, understand more the criminals. I mean, using that criminal versus cops relationship in terms of understanding uh, policy as made or policy as practiced. Great, thank you, Professor Zhang. And uh, Raoul, Richard, any feedback, comments? Um, well, maybe something brief. It's of course a profound question that uh, Mike asks. It's um, how are we changing in front of our very eyes? It's really hard. I'm not in the business of predicting. I'm not good at that kind of analysis, but you know, there's uh, reflecting on it, this uh, experience of this pandemic, there is an opportunity here. It's a profound thing that ha have, never have we, as a, as a global community, experienced something almost universally. And so for the individual, you know, to chime in on what Anthony was saying, Bonfren Brenner said you can analyze things from multiple perspectives, the individual, micro, miso, macro, individually, we have something now we share in common with all humanity. Does that create more empathy in our case? Or, there is also, on the other hand, I think uh, both Anthony and uh, Richard does talks um, allude to it, this rise of the ideological that uh, this is um, the COVID experience is giving new life to the clash of civilization, but it's not like Huntington and Vision. It's not the clash of socialism and capitalism. Everybody's capitalist now. I mean, forget it. But um, is in ideology with a small I that we all wrapped up in these intersectionalities that we, we call ideologies and whether it's on an individual level between or in between in individual and institution and the government between reds and blues between US and China these ideological battles are shaping the world today. And so there's an opportunity. How do we find new institutions for working out <clears throat> the ideological pitch battle? The old institutions, well, we're trying them, right? They seem not to be working in US Congress. So do we find new kinds of forms of deliberation, new ways of representation to heal all these ideological divides that in and of itself, they don't lead to these very um, satisfactory conclusion. You know, it's, uh, what was it called for mutual partisan adjustment? We go left and we go right and we go back left. That doesn't work for the world we have today. It's chaotic. So how do we find a dialogue within this clash of ideologies? 
Um, but other than that, it just, uh, I have a hard time peering into it and drawing uh, substantive conclusions right now. Right, Richard. Ed has kindly offered to uh, step in. Uh, okay, uh, thanks my, for the questions. And, and, and uh, when we are referring to the embeddedness of views, uh, we are ex actually echoing other speakers in terms of this kind of polarization that we are facing uh, in terms of the, the post-crisis scenario uh, in US, in, 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 in Hong Kong, in other parts of the world. I think the crisis somehow reinforced uh, the belief of different camps. And, and that I think that uh, political scientists and policymakers, they are actually talking about so-called effective polarizations that people are tied to us uh, different partisans believing that they hold the fact and the truth. Okay, and all these kind of things uh, somehow shaped their world view and also make them very difficult to compromise. And I think uh, this is precisely uh, why we see this kind of uh, embedded views seems to be actually strengthened uh, because of all these uh, COVID and also social crisis. And, and, but, but I think we also see some opportunities in the sense, uh, in terms of the methodological and also policy advice that we suggest. I mean, we, we know that we are living in a digital era, okay? And, and in which uh, the digital uh, technology somehow we enforce a lot of this kind of, because the, of their algorithm, because of all, all, all this, they, they somehow reinforce this kind of echo chambers. But I think we are also seeing that actually the international communities and also these big tech companies, they are actively engaging in, in trying to hope that they will change the way they, 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 they filter information and they, they feed information to others, change the algorithms. And also in a way, uh, they try to actually establish some new regulative frameworks. And I think this precisely that, that we are looking into uh, resolving some of these issues. Uh, and I think another point that we like to raise is the affordance. That mean we need to know that actually different social media have different affordance in the sense that some will actually lead to, for example, more polarized view, but some will actually encourage more deliberation. I mean, for example, treaters, I mean, they, the ad mention function and, and, and all this will only let you to focus on certain things, right? But some platforms, uh, for example, the reason we have Clubhouse and all this, when people face to talk to each other, they seem to able to more uh, to resolve some of their differences when they are uh, talk to, talking to each other. So I think that there are new opportunities somehow provided by digital information technologies that people can really engage in uh, more deliberated kinds of uh, 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 po de deliberated politics and under each other's position. And of course, it is really up to the policy circles and other how to really engage all, in all these kind of changes. Uh, yeah, so I, I think I will just stop here. Yeah. Thank you. And we have received uh, one, uh, two actually, you know, interrelated, you know, questions from, from C. I think that this set of questions is intended to Raoul and Wingshan. Can you guys see the question raised by C? Can you see that? Click the Q&A bar. C was asking, won't social relationships lead to social capital? If so, how the government captures these kinds of relationships and reflex to better to create better social safety net systems. Are there any concerns that they rely on such an informal social relationship or social safety net and cut the budget on this area? And aren't better social relationships correlated with social status or economic situation, or aren't it, you know, won't it strengthen such disparity? Yeah. Uh... And so, yes, uh, the social relationships are social capital that can be drawn on by anyone, including government. And so the fear here is that, well, if we displace government, how can we rely on something informal? So hard to predict. But um, there, there is a, the Hong Kong case is interesting in, in this regard, you know, that, well, perhaps I can ask Dr. Khan to talk about the case management idea, how this addresses the problem. Well, uh, uh, I think uh, first, uh, 
I think government um, actually had to do something. Uh, um, uh, for example, they can uh, promote uh, the benefits of uh, family caregiver because uh, in our case study is about the elderly people in Hong Kong. Um, is we try to uh, first of all build up their uh, social supportive network. I think uh, informal caregiver is uh, one of the uh, major network. For example, in Hong Kong. Um, uh, to a certain extent, uh, maybe they can um, uh, encourage uh, some company, okay, uh, to let them, uh, uh, some family caregiver to have a flexible working hour, for example, so uh, they can have time to take care of the uh, elderly. I think this is part of the government can do it. And what uh, Professor Lehano mentioned about uh, the case management model, uh, actually is, uh, I think um, we need someone, okay, uh, to help the elderly to uh, uh, combine different forms of uh, social network or so-called social capital to do so. But uh, I think so far in Hong Kong, uh, in um, social welfare setting or uh, even healthcare setting, we don't have a comprehensive uh, uh, case management model to help to uh, let with different uh, uh, so-called capital together, yeah. Yeah, so the, the idea is that the government, the state can support the informal in different ways, including this idea that the wing had of a case manager helping the uh, client to balance different forms of capital. And if there's something missing, it's a flexible approach. They draw from some other resource to support in this area. And so we're thinking about, are there more flexible modes of governance that allow for integrating relational social capital into governance because it is there and it's required for the policy to work. Great, great. Thank you so much. Um, any questions from the audience? Yes, Professor Jan, please. Yes, I, I okay. Yes, I, I would like to um, uh, end my view about the issue of social capital. I mean, I'm using Hong Kong as illustration. Now, right now, because of what happened over the last couple of years, uh, the political unrest, polarization, uh, all kinds of extremism, whether on the blue side or yellow side, so to speak. Now, and then of course, government has a very low level of trust. Uh, so it's, it's, it appears that uh, we lack social trust. And it appears therefore that uh, social capital is problematic as a whole for Hong Kong. But at the same time, I think that Hong Kong still has, I mean, I'm, I'm looking at it not based on any statistical, empirical uh, data, but I think by and large, Hong Kong still has good social capital in the sense that Hong Kong has not fallen despite all these problems. I mean, our society as a whole still stays relatively resilient in terms of social order, in terms of business as usual, we are carrying on despite all the, all the problems. So that leads me to think that, okay, maybe at, at a more macro level for government making policies, of course, given the current environment, I, I think it would be quite difficult for any uh, uh, policy to be made that will, that will receive wide acceptance and then governments, uh, uh, the government probably is highly constrained in terms of responding to all kinds of needs in society. But at the same time, if we take the point that, okay, social capital, small s, at the more uh, underground, is still there, that means there's still a lot to be done. I mean, if you uh, using the example of case management, for example, uh, and, and Rao and Wingshan's study, perhaps at the individual 
micro contexts, actually a lot of uh, uh, capital, so small as social capital can still be drawn based on relationships, based on trust at that micro level, not at the macro level, but at the micro level. So I think we need, perhaps we need to distinguish the two uh, so that uh, any uh, pessimism at the macro level will not lead to pessimism at the, local, at the more micro level. Mm. Great, that's a great point. Any other questions? Uh, I think we've got one in the chat box. Yes, as Michael. It's raised by Professor Howlett and uh, intended to Richard Edmund and your team. Did you test or measure the pre-experiment amount of knowledge each respondent had? And can that be inferred from number of reasons given for the respondent's position? I'm wondering if there's a dummy kruger kruger uh, type effect and here. Not pre, but we asked them about the, under the self-assessment of their understanding of the policy. Um, so, I can't remember. Jason was asked. Jason, do you know, was that asked before or after the vignette? Do you recall? Is Jason with us? Uh, oh. I think. Yeah. Edmund. I think we yeah we asked them to self rank before, and then uh, the self report their understanding of their policy uh, areas that we study. Yeah, yeah. Because we, we, yeah. Thank you. We provided a short explanation of, of the level of knowledge. Uh, so we gave uh, an example. Uh, I, can't, I, I forget, sorry, the, the, what policy area. And maybe it was immigration. It was a different policy area, immigration, something to do with elite immigration, I think. Yes. So we, we, we outlined um, someone's understanding of a particular policy and gave, and gave the example and, and gave the response on the scale. Um, so I, I can't remember if it, I think it was sort of relatively low. Then we went on, so we, we gave them, we created some sort of expectation of what we meant um, by their policy understanding. Then we went on to ask them about their policy understanding um, and then ran the, uh, ran the study. And then I have to be completely ignorant because I don't know what a Dunning-Kruger type effect is. <laughs> just, just, just that, uh, you know, you don't know enough to know you don't know enough. You don't, yeah. But, 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 but the presumption of the study is that you don't know enough to know enough because you already think you know more than you actually know. Right. So same, same, sort of, <laughs> same, sort of, the same sort of, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll cite that now. But the same sort of idea is in the illu knowledge illusion. Yeah. There is a, there's an overstatement. I mean, what was odd in the study is if we are believing those self um, assessments, uh, uh, policy understanding, they correlate with extremity. So, so in this in, in the, for these studies, in fact, the more people said they understood, the more entrenched or embedded mm. uh, their, their, their view was. Mm. Mm. Right. Though it could, maybe if I could just add to that, just but that still could be, you know, a, a big difference between the objective and the subjective side of that, right? So, oh, yeah. Yeah. you could still objectively know very little, but think you do, and then have a very high. Yes. Rank, rank yourself very highly. Yeah. yeah. So, so this is. Ed was talking about this reason. This is the idea of a sort of an anchoring vignette where you, where you try to actually get a better grasp. It's still sort of subjective, but you're trying to get a better grasp because um, you, you may say you know everything um, about the basic law in Hong Kong. Anthony probably knows even more. Um, but you may rate yourself the same, but as you say, but your actual understanding is different. So there are, there are techniques um, that we could use in the, in the future that try to better um, get at that and then and to see if that then influences the results because the the implication of this is it, it potentially reduces um some of, some of that extremity i think okay. yeah. great any other questions from the floor or among the speakers and maybe i just want to echo with anthony's talk about social resilience at the micro level because we, uh, Richard and I, we actually did some uh, survey, uh, panel survey and internet survey during the COVID in some of the best performers during COVID. 
uh, in the East Asia region. I think we can agree that uh, all these society, uh, South Korea, Japan, Hong Kong, Taiwan, and, and seems to be relatively good performing uh, this kind of uh, COVID measure. And it's not entirely because of the, partly because of the government's policy, but also because of the society's compliance. And, and we did, I think, find a lot of variable that in support of this kind of uh, social capital and also communitarian uh, network that are somehow being quite helpful in this region uh, in explaining people's compliance and also their, 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 their classroom mobilizations. Mm. I think that, that will be something that we can really further dig into uh, when we look at uh, this kind of uh, COVID crisis and post-COVID era. Well, if I can add to what Edmund was saying just very quickly, I remember a year ago in Hong Kong when it, it was just becoming apparent that it, the uh, epidemic was, was bleeding out of Wuhan. And I saw Hong Kong residents just snap into action, not waiting for anybody to, not waiting for the WHO to say it was driven by aerosols. They, they already had these strategies and developing it through uh, WhatsApp, et cetera. And so that's social capital. But I, I thought I'd, I'd give a chance to uh, ask the same question of uh, Michael and, uh, and Alex about, are you sensing any shifts that we're seeing right now you know, because of this crisis in terms of governance or policy discourse or um, what is your crystal ball showing? Mine is very murky. Yes, <laughs> as, as always. Uh, well, well, I mean, one of, I, I'm still sort of in the uh, methodology stage of how to, how to assess it, but the, the, uh, my, my initial inclination is that it's the, the sectoral level is really key. So I'm thinking, you know, if, if you were to assume that there's, uh, you know, the kind of perfect response to COVID might be no response at all. So you just, you know, you bounce back 100% to where you were before. So my question would be, you know, when is that likely not to happen? And when is it likely to happen? So in some sectors, like I'm thinking maybe, I don't know, agriculture or something like that. Um, you're not looking at a lot of disruptions. You probably just bounce back where you were before. But in some other sectors, like for instance, you know, there's a lot of, lot of talk around, you know, work at home and, and so on. You know, th this has the potential to shift, uh, you know, issues, uh, gender issues and family issues and, and so on. Uh, in ways that may not uh, be able to, to bounce back. And there would be sectoral consequences to that in areas like education policy and, and uh, labor force, uh, labor market policy, and so on. So that what we're likely to get, I think, is a kind of patchwork where some sectors will be heavily impacted, other ones won't be impacted at all, you know, some will be in the middle somewhere. Um, and then to get sort of back to the question that I had asked Anthony at the beginning, you, then the national results from that would be different depending on what the sector, the importance of those sectors which didn't bounce back and which did in the different countries that are involved. So again, you likely to get a fairly complex pattern across countries, but you would be able to get maybe to predict that or get a, get a hold of that by being able to say something about the, the likelihood of the sectoral changes. Um, but that's that's it for me for now. <laughs> I don't really have any <laughs> anything more than that. Well, we're all we're all professors. Higher education it's creating this profound right. shift. Uh, you know, it just uh, who knows what next year may wield. Another ten percent drop in our enrollment at NYU, is, you know, in the poorhouse. But yeah, that's right. for another day. Yeah. Right, but that would be an example of a of a sector that I think is is not likely to just bounce back where it was before. I already, you know, I have colleagues in, in Italy uh, who've been told already that um, from now on, you know, it's hybrid instruction. It's already, it's in, they're not going back where they were before. And, you know, there's cost implications and, and other things that makes it advantageous for them to do that. Great. Actually, just now Studi typed in a comment regarding, you know, Richard paper, and she found that, you know, there was a higher position extremity for females. So Richard and Adam, do you think this is very uniquely Hong Kong or, you know, is there any, any other explanations? Uh, 
this is the problem of covariate analysis. So we, <laughs> so should we have conducted it? Um, I, I don't know if that has any thoughts, but I have no, no uh, explanation. I don't know if that does. Yeah, play safe. Play safe. It's recorded. Yeah. So, uh, no. I mean, at, at this stage, it's an observation. We, we don't have a hypothesis. Yeah, the former minister has something to say. Well, I'm not uh, trying to offer an explanation. I'm just wondering, because, um, I mean, that kind of intensity about one's position on issues or politics, I mean, uh, and Richard and his team's uh, paper, or I mean, probably his drawing on other studies, uh, the term extremism is being used. So I'm just wondering at which point we will say, well, this is not really extremism. This is rather the mainstream. <laughs> because uh, if you look at it in terms of uh, the, 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 the growth of uh, sort of populism, which is the word being used in the literature or in the media about the phenomenon worldwide, gradually, the, the French views, the more extremist views, some of them are becoming mainstream mm. because they're coming to center stage. So I think perhaps we need to go beyond uh, the term, the notion of extremism or radicalism to really understand what lies behind that kind of expression. I mean, the sentiment. So I'm more thinking about, okay, does the kind of extremism that we observe in certain segments of the population, whether female or male, young or old, perhaps uh, it's more common among the younger generation. Does that come from the, um, the state of emotional response? They find that they have more emotional support from their own small groups, uh, they, they don't have confidence in the mainstream, basically the lack of trust in the mainstream. Mm. So uh, with respect to that, in terms of cognitive understanding of issues, probably the current generation has the same, only have the same, have the same degree of trust as the previous generation. But in the previous generation, meaning the pre-extreme generation, they trust the policymakers or they trust the experts enough, but now they don't trust the experts. That doesn't mean they have greater understanding, they have similar understanding, but because the context is different now. Mm -hmm. Therefore, the way they articulate their anxiety, their lack of trust, uh, or their small eye ideology, will be different. And then we're so, uh, so much in contrast with the traditional mainstream or the conventional will, and therefore that is extremism, that is populism. But at some point, things might change. And, um, and also the sense of identity. I always feel that people tend to become more extreme if they have more anxiety in terms of their identity, whether vis-a-vis -vis nation versus nation or small communities, small ethnic group versus other groups. So I think perhaps uh, it would be useful uh, in, in other studies to really uh, tease out uh, this extremism mm. and understand what's in, inside that extremism. Great, great. Thank you. We, we received one more question from our Thai student and a great question in the, in the you know, Q&A bar. And anti-fragility is better than resilience. You know, he was talking about the, you know, the term, how, how do we describe it? And is it possible to make a policy that helps people to be stronger enough at the beginning for crisis or pandemic better preparedness resilience and so they don't have to be recovered any response well you know it's a partly it's um you, would you like to expand the notion of resilience to include this the system not crashing, but uh, some of the things that our speakers were talking about are trying to do that. You know, this permanent turn to hybrid education means that 
if there's a next crisis, hopefully not, but you know, if there is, then the system won't crash. Education might transition better without losing months of education. Right now, what we saw is a generation of kids who lost a year of schooling. Next time, if it happens again, perhaps this hybrid system will help. So we're trying to build in more resilience. And I'm not a big fan of the term because it means everything, but, um, and yet there's some things that, you know, it just, uh, how can you insulate a system against something so massive? Great. Any other questions from the floor? I, I do have one for, for Richard's team. So probably I overlooked some of the key information regarding the timing of, of, your, of your experiments. Were they done prior to COVID-19 or during COVID-19? Because lots of opinion studies have found out that this, this pandemic has caused some notable changes in mainstream values, for example, preference for a stronger state and so on. So, and also in the kind of the mood has been, has been changed. So how would that, the timing effect affect your results? If I recall, I think the first experiment was run in June and the second and third in July and August this year. So we were more wondering about effects arising from the national security law, mm. rather than given the one of the topics being about the basic law. Um, <clears throat> but I can't remember, the, but the given our first and second studies are relatively similar with an additional question. So the second study was the donation. Mm. Um, and if I recall the sort of baseline responses in aggregate terms remained relatively stable. Um, so that we, so rather than COVID, we did have an event mm. um, in Hong Kong, which could have had influence on people's perceptions, but it, but my recollection is that that event didn't um, influence results as much as we anticipated. Um, in relation to it, uh, so that, I mean, the whole thing was conducted when, I can't remember now, it seems a long time ago, doesn't it, with COVID, you know, every, every, everything goes slowly and quickly at the same time. Um, but I don't think COVID was particularly problematic then in Hong Kong, you know, quiet down a bit, but it, 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 I, I, I can't answer that question. It would just be um, speculation. Um, mm. So, but the whole study was conducted during mm. uh, COVID. But great that you know the the re statistically the, re the the results were still robust, right? That was yeah. great. Yeah, yeah, great. All right. So, no more questions, really. Okay. So, you know, it has been truly a very productive you know morning, and thank you all for your participation, and especially the speakers. And then we received lots of good comments and very you know. Uh, excellent interactions. So before we close the panel, you know, can I stress all of us, you know, to give a big, you know, round of applause, either virtually or, you know, uh, physically. And thank you all for your participation. And you're most welcome to join the panel sessions and look for the details from the program booklet. Thank oh, you so can much. Can take a photograph as well? Yes. All, yes. Just a screenshot of yeah, everyone. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, uh, Johnny, can I please request you to uh, help take it? Okay. Ready, three, two, one. Three, one more? Two, <laughs> one. All right. Okay, okay, thank you so much. Thank, thank you so you. much. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. 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 Thank you.